Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the uh, book of John, chapter 16. Uh, book of John, chapter number 16. We're only going to read one verse tonight because we're going to have a lot of verses as we go through uh, tonight So uh, uh, to t tie things together. You found John 16? Uh, please stand. We're going to look at verse number 33. Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tri uh, tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, simple verse, but think about it for a moment. Doesn't matter what's going on, Jesus is still in control. Doesn't matter what the problems we see around us, he still has answers. Doesn't matter what's happening to you personally, he's still your strength. He's still your hope. He is still the answer. Y'all, Anybody old enough to remember the uh, bumper sticker that went around a few years ago? Jesus is the answer. Now what's your question? He is the answer. Amen. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing tonight. We thank you that we can be in your house. We are thankful that we know that you have answers for all of our problems, that you are the solution, you are strength, and uh, you give us hope for tomorrow. And we ask that you would bless the message tonight as it comes from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. title of the message is very simple. Do you have a survival plan? Do you have a survival plan? There's a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about the problems that we have. Uh, Paul wrote, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. I can't think of a better verse to describe our time. There are so many sermons in that one verse. We could pull it apart and look at each thought and relay what is taking place in our society and in this world. But certainly, we live in perilous times. And men have forgotten about God. They've forgotten that he has the answers. They've forgotten to make him their strength. And now it all boils down to this. In general, men have a form of godliness, but really deny the power thereof. They fail to really trust God with anything. Well, Jesus also said this, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So Jesus tells us when it gets near the end, and, and remember, we're not talking about uh, the second coming in itself, we're talking about uh, the tribulation period, the, the signs toward that. But my, can we not see? Is it hard for anyone to understand when you read what Jesus said that we must be living in that day? Well, there's another 
place that he, he writes. And uh, in Luke 21, verse 9, he says, When you shall hear of wars and commotions. Now, commotions is a little different than some of the other things that we've read. But there's a lot of commotions going on in our country, aren't there? If you understand what that is. Be not terrified. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Today we live in a world of crisis. Anyone who denies that is really not seeing what's going on around them. We live in a, a world of turmoil. We do live in those perilous times. And so there's a, a lot of crisis that we can mention within our country and within the world. But in the world there are a few of those that we think about. People are concerned about Korea, where they're going to get a, a rocket and a bomb that will reach the United States or not. What about Iran? Korea and Iran together are great exporters of terrorism. And uh, both of those, we worry about uh, them starting some kind of nuclear war. Russia is doing some things that ought not to be done and siding with some folks that they shouldn't be siding with. They could be a, a next great threat. We all are concerned about ISIS and, and the fact of terrorism and the things that are going on in different countries around the world and even some that have happened here. The war in Syria and uh, the things that are taking place and even the refugees, where they go and how to determine that. And then Afghanistan is still on the scene. And I suppose that doomsdayers will gather their thoughts and find another crisis for all of us to worry about very soon. They just seem to be popping up all the time. But until then, I suppose that life will just have to go on in spite of all these crises in the world. I didn't mention everything. It would take forever and uh, uh, to, to mention them. But there's, you can't pick up the newspaper. Well, I don't pick up a newspaper. But you can't turn on the news without hearing of some crisis taking place somewhere. Those things are real. So the question is, do you have a survival plan? Now, I'm more interested and concerned with our moral and spiritual survival than I am the physical survival. Uh, that is what ought to be important to you and I. Do we have what it takes to live in a world of crisis, a world of perilous times? Do, what, do we have the right stuff? Do we have a survival plan? Well, God has given us a survival plan for difficult days. There are a lot of those that we can have. A lot of things in the scripture that, that relate to that. But uh, he's given us a plan, and there's the manual. God's word does have the answers. And his plan will get us through every difficult, hard time that we face. We'll not only survive, but we can thrive in perilous times. So I want you to consider with me tonight what we need to help us make it through in these days. First of all, we'll need provisions. If we're going to survive and have a survival kit, we need provisions. They'll have to be nourishing. They'll have to be durable and lasting. I'm hearing advertisements now on TV from, uh, not Ron Paul, his father, I can't think of his name now, uh, is trying to sell you uh, kits to make food that will, you can store for 25 years. Survival plans. 
Well, whatever we have, we, we need something that will be lasting and durable. And it'll have to be satisfying. So there's some things that we can look at. Job 23 and verse 12, Job says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job is not saying that we don't need food. But he's saying that there are some things that even are on a higher plane than food. And that is the words of God's mouth. He said he saw them and esteemed the words of his mouth more than his necessary food. If we are going to survive, we need to see the importance of God's word. It ought to be more than a book that's brought to Sunday school and church. God's word has answers for life. And we need to get a hold of them and understand that they will take care of us. The psalmist said it this way, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The psalmist said God's word satisfied. It was sweeter than even the honey uh, that they had. And then we find in Jeremiah that thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Here again we have the idea thy word was found and I did eat them. In other words I digested them. I didn't just get a snack. Didn't just get a little bit of God's word. I did, digested it. I thought about it. It became part of my life. You know, we all like to eat. But when we eat, certain parts of that food become part of our body, our life. There's vitamins, there's nourishment that comes from proper diets. But he said the, that God's words, when digested, were the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I submit to you that too many of us have lost the joy of God's word. The joy of having it daily in our lives. And then, of course, we must always remember what Jesus said. Because he said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He wasn't saying that we don't eat. He's just saying that there are other things that are just as important as necessary food. That we uh, understand that every word that comes from the mouth of God is essential to our being. We talk about balanced diets, don't we? And uh, you may have all kinds of ideas what a balanced diet is. And so some of us are not sure that we get it, so we add some vitamins to our diet to get everything that we're supposed to have. And then when our body doesn't function quite right, uh, somebody told me tonight, the doctor said, well, you need this and this. And they've added those things and then they added something else to balance our diet. Well, what's going to really sustain us? I submit to you that uh, if we're really going to survive, it must be the word of God or we will be discouraged. If you listen to the news day in and day out and you are not in the word of God, you are going to be one miserable person. It's almost difficult to turn the news on today, isn't it? because you hear so many good things that are happening. Don't get much report on, on that, do we? But there are some good things. 
All right, we need the proper provision, which something to sustain us, which is food. And then we need others to help us along the way. Here's a clue in saying that is this. We cannot make it alone. We need each other. Remember what the scripture says. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. The TV commercial. If you remember, it says, they make a phone call and says, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. No one to help you. But God's people need each other. There are times when each of us are discouraged and we need someone to pick us up. There's times when we're going through troublesome times. Family or relation or other things. And we need someone to be there to lift us and encourage us. We're told to edify or to build up one another in the scripture. So we need each other. We must not forget that when we join together in a church, we take partners together to encourage one another, to build one another, to strengthen one another, to pray for one another, and to serve God together in unity. So having said that, then we need the local church. Now, you may envision yourself as a loner, someone who needs no one else, but that isn't true. You may think so today, but the time will come when you will need someone. But as believers, we just said we need one another. So God has made provision for us to find strength and encouragement that we need. He has done that through the local church. Now, I know some believe this way, so let me just say, you can listen to radio preachers and TV preachers. You can watch the shows on the religious net networks, but nothing, and I mean nothing, can take the place of the local church in the life of a believer. Someone got mad at me one time. Now, we were still back in the old building. I don't know why I remember that. But they brought some papers to me and was talking about this and I don't know if the guy's still on or not anymore. He, he was old then, I think. And uh, he was the radio pastor. Now, you can't pastor somebody you're not around. You can't lead somebody that's not there to follow. And I just threw the paper back. I said, that's ridiculous. You need a local church, not a radio pastor, not a TV pastor. We need one another. God designed the church to meet our needs perfectly, even in troublesome times. Listen to what he said. Not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but what are we to do? To exhort one another. Well, you can't do that if you're not together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we talk about the last days, as we talk about those troublesome times, this is the time we need the church more than any other time. This is the time that you need to be involved with God's people more than any other time in history. Now, I realize society's changing, but it shouldn't change God's word. It shouldn't change the local church. It shouldn't change believers. 
So what are we to do? We're to exhort one another and do it even more as we see these things around us. Well, the second thing that we need is a communication plan. Now, first of all, we obviously need to communicate with God, and we do that through prayer. But I'm not talking about some mumble-jumble so-called language. Prayer is when we, when we talk to God about what's on our hearts. When someone comes to me with a problem, they don't have some form. Sometimes they're a little scattered in their thinking. But they try to lay out what's going on in their life. To try to find answers. To try to find hope. To try to find encouragement. And most people are able to come sit down and just lay what's on their heart. No form. That's the way we should be with God. You know, some people pray in King James. I got a feeling he understands our crazy English too. Some people have learned to pray the way other people pray and maybe they mention the name of God 14 times in their prayer. I'm pretty sure he doesn't forget who he is when I start talking to him. My prayer should be just a matter of me and God talking together. And when we talk to God about what is on our hearts, that's the kind of prayer that gets answers and solutions. You see, God is omniscient. He knows all. Since he knows everything, why should I bother to pray? If he already knows what my need is, why should I even pray? Well, first of all, it's to be obedient to our Heavenly Father. God has commanded us in the scripture to pray. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. All through the New Testament you find that we are taught to pray. God commanded us to pray. Jesus taught his, now listen carefully because this is not going to sound right. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, not just how to pray. There is a difference. Remember what happened when the disciples come to him one time? And it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. The question was, not the words, but how do we pray? How do we approach God? How do we talk to him? So someone might look and say, well, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and on and on with that. That is not what we're talking about. That was teaching a structure of prayer. He's teaching them how to pray. Those are not words that we are to pray over and over and over again. But the structure's there when we look at that. So it was given as a model for us to pray. It's sometimes called the Lord's Prayer, but that's not so. John chapter 16, chapter 17, you find the Lord's Prayer. We're not to pray that prayer specifically, but we're in to include the elements of the, that model when we pray. So we need to communicate with God. We've already mentioned we need others, but we need to learn to communicate with others with wise words, the way we say things. 
as we've already talked about the importance of uh, other believers in our lives, but we are important to them also. And so we must choose sometimes our words carefully because words are misunderstood and twisted too often today. But not only are we important to one another as we communicate, we're important to the lives of unbelievers just as well as we are one another. So we must be able to communicate the message, the gospel, uh, to those who are without Christ. That message needs to be simple. It needs, needs to be clearly presented that it might be clearly understood. So Jesus sent us forth with the task of reaching our world with the gospel. Then said Jesus in John chapter 20 and 21, uh, 20 and verse 21, uh, to them again, peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Think about that verse for just a moment. He said, the Father sent me for a purpose. Now, we know what the purpose was. We talked about that even this morning some. But he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die for the sins of the world. And he said, I was sent with a purpose. He said, even as God, the heavenly Father, hath sent me, even so send I you. We have a purpose. God didn't save you and just leave you here so that you could occupy space, so that you could breathe the air. He left you here for a purpose. If there were no purpose for us after salvation, God would have been much more merciful just to take us on to heaven. We wouldn't have had to deal with these difficult times that we live in. But he said he sent us. So what did he send us with? He gave us a commission. We've talked about that over and over again. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have a job to do. We need to communicate to the world. And then we thirdly need a plan for protection. I'm not talking about an arsenal of weapons, assault rifles and automatic weapons and the like, because that will not accomplish what we need. Every now and then my wife says she needs to get a pistol for protection. Not with me around that house, she's not. I don't trust her. <laughs> She'll shoot my pinky toe off or something. But the reality is that may help when that burglar walks in the door. And, I, you know, I'm having a couple of shootings here recently uh, of people trying to rob somebody and they had guns in the house and they took care of it. I'm all for that, by the way. You may not be. You may think that's a terrible thought. But I think you have a right to defend your own property. But the reality is, we're not gonna change the whole world with guns. The only thing that changes men and women, boys and girls, is the word of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul warned us to be careful of this. He warned us that carnal weapons would not help because we are in a spiritual battle. He said, for the weapons of our warfare are not, are not carnal, but mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have some weapons. If you want a weapon, there's a sword. It works, by the way. It just works. 
when I was youth pastor back in the dark ages, some of you knew some of the kids I had. I had some pretty bold kids, I guarantee you. And uh, they would do things that would scare most people to death today. But, uh, oh, no, I don't want to get those illustrations. I'll chase those rabbits. But let me give you one thing that I always told them. You may take the word of God to them and someone says, well, they don't want to listen to it. You don't have to take the whole Bible. You don't have to preach a whole sermon. Know some verses. You know, a sword will kill immediately. But if I have a small knife and I punch it enough times, it'll kill them too. So get you a little dagger. Get you a verse. And the next time, give them enough, another verse. And the next time, give them another verse. And if you give out enough of the Word of God, they're either going to run or they're going to get right with God. But the problem is we're not giving it out today. We have a weapon, and it's not a carnal weapon. Our warfare is different. We're in a spiritual battle. And so I don't need some of the weapons spiritually. Now, I know that there are those who advocate uh, getting an arsenal and protecting yourself. Uh, I guarantee you they come in with bombs. That few guns that you have are not going to do a whole lot. But I can tell you this, our protection comes from God. And so our help comes from his word. Our security is in him and not in ourselves and not in the weapons that we could have. We're told in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Bible talks about us being sealed. Now, what did a seal do? It did several things. One of the things that a seal did in that day was it identified. If a king or some important person sent a letter or a note, wax would be put on the paper to seal it, and then they usually had a ring with their seal in it and they would push it down, and that mark was there, and that identified the person who wrote the letter. A seal was an identification. You see, the Holy Spirit identifies to the world that we are God's children, that God is taking care of us. Well, it not only seals that way and identifies, but it preserves us. It was, it's a seal of protection as the Holy Spirit seals us unto the day of redemption. That means I'm protected. Now, I am not saying that America would never be in a war, that we wouldn't have some people killed. But I can guarantee you this. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to be in heaven. That we know. And so that seal is our protection. We are kept by the power of God, not by our own strength, not by our own knowledge, not by anything but God. Someone said, uh, told him, asked me one time, aren't you concerned about losing your salvation? And I said, yeah, I really am. Except it's not in my hands. It's in God's hands. He protects me. He seals me. And I'd be concerned about me losing it, but I'm not a bit concerned about God losing it. I'm not a bit concerned about God failing. God can do that which I cannot do. He saved me when I could not save myself. He keeps me when I cannot keep, my, keep myself. And he protects me 
when I can't take care of myself. You see, we have a God that's like that. So tonight, as we consider things, how's your survival kit? Do you have the tools in it for survival? Do you have the things that you need? You need the church. You need one another. You need all of those things. You need provisions. In other words, as we talked about that, we need a communication plan. We need that. We need a plan of protection. Do you have those things today? God wants to provide them. But you start at the foot of Jesus. You start at the foot of the cross. Commit everything into his hands and let him take care of you. Let us stand for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment. It's an amazing thing. When we let God take care of the things that he's supposed to take care of and we take care of the things that we're supposed to take care of, it usually works out. But when we think we need, we can do things in God's stead, we fail. When we fail to listen to God, we fail. When we fail to adhere to his word, we fall. But we have answers. God has given them. Have you put them in your survival kit? Heavenly Father, as we continue the service with just a few moments of invitation hymn, speak to our hearts. Help us to be prepared to live in a dangerous world, a perilous time, a time when many just give up. Many see no hope. But we have a hope. We have a blessed hope. We know that you're coming for us. And we'll look forward to that day. But while we're here, help us to make use of the tools that you've given us so that we as individuals, we as a church, can be effective in this world of trouble and trial. We ask your blessing now in the invitation in Jesus' name, amen.